Now uh, let's uh, give the floor to the question, uh, which that uh, the question directly to raise your question and uh, less comments because we don't have much time. First, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, um, Tony Addison from uh, WIDA. Um, given the enormous uh, cost to the Finnish economy, something like 9% gross, um, clearly poorer countries would find it very difficult to bear that cost. So would one implication of your talk and the Nordic crisis be that developing countries, particularly low-income countries, should stick with financial repression and capital controls and a limited banking system for as long as possible? Second one. Yeah, please. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, clarification on uh, the development results side, uh, pre-regulation and uh, post-regulation. The way the banks are using finances to develop the economy. Did you see? any difference in the uh, two periods, whether the regulation had a significant influence on financing for development results. Are there the third one? Thank you very much. Finta from you and you wider. First of all, let me say thank you very much for these two excellent overviews of a very complicated area. I said in my opening remarks yesterday that restructuring of the nation's financial system is now the first and on top of the list of three core issues that Vietnam is facing. So obviously this is extremely relevant. Um, in Denmark there was a bank and building crisis in 1907-08. It's a little studied crisis but there are some striking similarities between what we have seen subsequently. 1907-08, 100 years before. Seppo, you mentioned that a fully laissez-faire system may be unstable. I was sort of wondering whether you might want to just, just elaborate a little bit and relate it to that, the questions of how quick and how gradual do you actually go about doing uh, your business. The situation is that for example, in the case of Vietnam, there is a clear discussion about how quick and how gradual should you do things. Um, this may be at the very core of whether this ends up being a success or a failure. So I'm sort of wondering whether, whether the two of you, and thank you, Raphael, as well, for bringing that number of other dimensions. But I think this is sort of at the very core of the approach that you're now going to take. So I would appreciate if you would sort of elaborate on that. Uh, first round to reply, each three right. minutes, two minutes. <laughs> and okay. now we can have a second round question. Sure, uh, let me, uh, maybe I'll start with, with Raphael's discussion. There are many, there were many points, but let me just take up a couple of, uh, uh, a couple of uh, points there. Uh, one is that, uh, you know, you have to, often, often these crises come because of policy mistakes, but also market mistakes. I think that is important. Uh, you know, I, I was saying that the risk perceptions in controlled finance, long, you know, which for decades with controlled finance systems, will, when you liberalize, then, then you, know, you have to somehow educate the people. And that was not done. So that's certainly one, one important. The recent period, that graph was very, very in interesting, in fact. You see, what happened now as part of the, you know, this uh, 2007 uh, uh, onward crisis, for the Nordic countries, we did not have, apart from Iceland, which is a different story, but uh, had, did not have any systemic crisis. There were banking problems in Denmark and also in some Swedish banks, namely those which had gone in a big way to the Baltic countries, which had, uh, had a major, major decline in GDP and so forth. So, so that, was not, uh, that was not the Iceland is a different story. Uh, and let me not get into that, otherwise I'll talk very long. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, about so, but that's that's quite uh, quite important, uh, quite important to note that. But nevertheless, you know, nevertheless, you know, we are, you are affected by you know the and, and Nordic countries. The real developments are affected by the fact that uh, much of the 
Western world or the transatlantic world, I think, was, was, it has had pretty slow development since. So that, that I think, is, is, is worth saying, saying there. Then, as, comes, as, as it comes to these, uh, uh, to the, uh, to the co uh, comments from, or discuss, uh, questions from the floor, the first, Tony's question about the real GDP. Yes, they were very high, and, and it was definitely a, a tough period to get, uh, get to, to find a political consensus. That was found there, and, and, and things worked out, out there. Uh, I, think, I think one lesson from the Nordic ones, you know, really Finland, Norway, and Sweden uh, has kept the capital controls as long as possible. I think that was a mistake, in fact. The Danish uh, way of, of, they went much with the Western European, they were closer to the Western, and which was a gradual liberalization, various steps going on, when in a period when, when things were relatively smooth and not doing it too fast. Uh, that, I think, worked on the way. So I think the important thing is to realize that, that you know, as, as a country becomes more international, international like you know, Nordics at that time, there will be pressures on the on the tight uh, tight financial uh, fi tightly controlled financial system. It it'll probably start to leak somewhere. I mean, we you know the the, the gray gray fi financial intermediation will pick up and so forth. So you you have to somehow have uh, keep that in mind also. So I think the right policy is not to st strict uh, stay with strict controls as long as you can but rather reform gradually. Think of an overall strategy to reform and, and watch out for, you know, because, uh, you know, if you don't, if you try to control tightly, it'll leak probably somewhere. And that, you know, where, of course, that depends on the, on the circumstances. But that, that, I think, is important. You have to respond to that and start thinking about uh, an overall strategy. And it's not just the steps. You have to plan the macroeconomic framework as well. I think that is, that's quite important. As, as regards, there was this question about the bank financing. Uh, uh, for before then and after the crisis, you see, uh, at that time, of course, the you know the banks in the Nordic countries, on the whole, were not this this multifunction uh, big operation which had you know standard banking and investment banking as well. The investment arms of these banks were small. Uh, I mean, there were some, but uh, they were small, uh, small there, and and so the, the banking systems were simpler. I think uh, 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 the you know what happened during the crisis. Uh, crisis, you know, when we were restructuring, there were obviously, uh, obviously some, uh, you know, we saw the negative credit growth there, whether that, you know, in, in the Nordic countries during the financial crisis period, is that the demand driven or is that the supply driven? Uh, it, it, that's always a difficult question. Question, we, I've actually, with some colleagues, made some studies uh, uh, on the Finnish case. And the evidence is not clear. I mean, even though you, you try to do the best econometrics on this and with, with the data, it's not clear. There were, clearly, there were some, some, uh, some financial constraints on firms. And obviously, uh, but, but, you know, it, the evidence is, is not so clear. Obviously, the recession also meant that the demand for lending, uh, new loans, was, was also going down quite a lot. So the Finnish case, I know, uh, I've, I've seen the you know, know the studies. Uh, uh, and I've done them so partly myself, so that evidence is not so clear. But uh, but that is of obviously a risk, you know, uh, that if you really if things really go bad in the banking system, they, it could be that you start to get credit constraints on companies, and that will that will make the recession worse. So that uh, that it's an, the the then there was this broader question about the the Danish to 1907 08 crisis. I have to look into. I I don't know that experience in. Any, any, any detail. Of course, the crises were before World War One. You know, we had, we had a, a financial crisis all sort of every ten years or so in, in several, several countries. Also, the major economies in, in, in many of the major economies. But this question about financial, free financial systems and market-based finances, are they unstable? This, of course, is a big controversy, in, in also in academic, academic research in economics. Uh, I think, uh, you know, they, 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 I think this controversy has always existed. You know, there, there has been uh, the, this, this view that the financial system and, and financial markets are different from other markets, which I certainly believe. I mean, the, the information problems, uh, et, cetera, et cetera, agency problems, uh, all of these moral hazard adversity, all of these things are, are, are very prevalent in financial markets. And, and whereas obviously they, they do exist in other markets and depends on the type of type of commodity that's being traded, but in financial markets they are very prevalent, 
And, and I, I, my, certainly my personal view is that, yes, uh, this, is, this is a serious concern. And I, I think, uh, you know, this, this trend towards de deregulation and less regulation that existed in the, in the Western economies since about 1980 or so, I mean, that, and one can even perhaps put uh, Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher as the names there. It, it actually, in many other parts of the economy, actually, it was a good thing. I mean, there was a law, so, you know, in standard stuff, uh, standard commodities, standard production activities, there was a lot of regulation, and, and doing less of that was very good. But I think in the financial systems, I think this was, this was a, a wrong trend, I think, we, uh, that we need. But obviously, you know, we also have to remember that financial systems are, are very difficult to control. New innovations, uh, new, new kinds of assets, new kinds of derivatives, what not, are being created. And so you have to be alert to that. Uh, the supervisors will have to be alert to that. And so this is a complicated subject. Uh, but I, I certainly believe, and I think that's a fairly common belief, uh, view on in, in nowadays, is that the, you know, the current financial crisis is, is partly created, because, is created to a large extent by the deregulation and, and these, these new forms of financial products, which turn out to be, turn out to be, uh, uh, turn out to be problematic, you know, those are good examples of these problems of, of, of moral hazard and, and adverse selection and imper very imperfect information, which are, which, and then some participants making use of the fact that the other people, other side doesn't understand these things fully. So all of these, I think, I think uh, this idea of, and, and, and Raphael also was alluding to simpler banking. I think that that certainly is, is a view that I share. But how to do it? And, and obviously, the, this will evolve, keep on evolving. Now, you know, we, we're now starting to see new, new you know, if you regulate banking system very tightly, the shadow banking, as it's nowadays called, not the gray system, but shadow banking, will become bigger. And then, in principle, the idea, you know, some people have suggested, yeah, let, let's just keep the shadow banking there and people will face their own risks. But what about if the ordinary banks get into some way into the shadow banking as well? And, and have, have, you know, have connections, have, have uh, a liability there. And if the shadow banking system crashes, that may bring the ordinary banking system, which after all is the basic lending channel and it, it handles the payment system in many countries. Is. That's, that's really the big thing, that you have to make sure that the payment system functions, continues to function, and also that, that the lending to ordinary lending to businesses and households continues to function. Um, let's see if, if I, I'm, I'm going to try to concentrate in one issue and see if with that I can, um, to some extent, um, sure. Okay, so let me just mention a few things. Um, you were talking, uh, Finn, about the, I believe it was you, about the, the fiscal cost and or the cost of this crisis, so you were talking about that, yeah. Uh, well, I, I didn't say that. It's easy to talk about this in 2014, but uh, the, the Chilean cost in terms of fis fiscal terms was close to 40%. That's the official estimation we have today. So at that time, I don't know if people were so happy about what was happening. Today, with the perspective of time and not paying anything of that 40%, we kind of uh, feel proud of what we did, but uh, I don't know if they were so proud at that time. So it was 40% in Chile. That was a fiscal cost, even though it was exposed a successful experience. Um, so I, I tend to, to, to favor the idea of, uh, and again, we're speaking to some extent, this is not very rigorous here. I, cannot, I don't have any question to show this, but, uh, but I, I, coming from this world and having the perspective uh, and the bias of a financial regulator, uh, I kind of believe that graduality is key. Um, now, the only concern that I have with graduality, with uh, implementing things in a slow way, is that, uh, of course, when, you, when you're moving in the right direction with graduality, it always generates cost to somebody and best interest have uh, more time to block what you're doing. Um, because no matter what you do, there's somebody who doesn't want you to do that in the economy, right? I mean, this is, uh, so uh, to some extent, at least in the short run, clearly at the individual level, uh, there is a zero, uh, zero sum game, right? Uh, so, so the problem with best interest group, I think, is key. And, and let me just make two comments about that, because I think it has to do with the challenges that we face in the future. The way Chile has managed to have a, a, a successful financial system at the end, exposed, has been having very large, very then strong, uh, very solvent, very profitable, 
banks that are very strictly regulated. So it's an equilibrium between the two parts, banks and regulators, but where they have really high profitability, over 20% of, uh, of returns, uh, with a low probability of crisis, and that's fine with a few qualifications. Uh, what happened in that, in that world when things start changing, and then you want, as Seppo was saying, innovation of some kind? What happens when you need to have some level of entry of, uh, of revolution? Uh, those large solvent vest interest groups, all they do is to block that. And the regulator is a victim of the same goal. Uh, so when you think today, and we were talking about this yesterday, about financial uh, inclusion, and you think about the possibility of putting the great marketing the cloud and having all these young guys who can lend money at a really, really low cost. Uh, I don't know, the probability of having a regulator that is going to accept that. Sleeping in the night is zero uh, because of the operational risk. There's always an excuse to block that and you have this. So that's something that I'm concerned about when you think about the future, given that today we're talking about issues that you didn't talk in Chile when you were at $3,000 per capita country, like consumer protection like innovation, like, and so And things that are important for Chile today with $20,000, but also important for rich countries, given the new technologies, uh, in the sense that we have opportunities. And I finish with this. There is this beautiful article in The Economist a few years ago saying that if you want to find smart and fun things happening in the banking sector, you need to go to Africa. You're not going to go to the US or Japan, because there the banks don't allow that to happen. Yeah. So, that's a huge issue, I believe, uh, that puts some challenges ahead of us. Um, okay. uh, questions? Uh, first, somewhere else, beside Tony. Oh, oh please. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I was just uh, struck by the, the movement of housing prices in, in Finland and, and the stability relative to shares and, and uh, talk about you know, the role of property and property prices in, in uh, a little bit more would be interesting. Are there areas? If not, Tony, please, the second row. Yes, um, uh, I really enjoy a financial crisis because it, it sort of, this is kind of deep economics, <laughs> you know, provided financially I'm not involved with it. Um, one question is, is the compatibility between um, central bank targeting of uh, the overall inflation rate and financial stability? Um, because what we're generally seeing, particularly at the moment, is uh, low inflation. That's the classic uh, target for central banks the very high asset price inflation, typically housing. And that obviously can lead to a problem over time. So there's the, the whole issue of macro prudential uh, regulation, which now the Bank of England is looking at very seriously. Because the Bank of England faces a problem, which is, you know, we have very low consumer price inflation, but very high asset price inflation now. And asset price inflation is typically the thing that leads to the blow up of the banking system as banks overlend. So I'd like a comment from Seppo about the compatibility between inflation targeting as we've conventionally done it for the last 30 years and the stability of the financial system. Secondly, just a brief point on this. this I think it's very crucial, the difference between the, the gross cost of a financial disaster and the net cost. Because while it's true that 30 years later or 20 years later, you can say, well, the net cost was really quite small, at the time, particularly for a poor country, it's a big demand on current tax revenue, and typically you have to issue public debt to recapitalize the banking system. And that's a large opportunity cost in terms of public spending on education and health and all the things that we need for development. So, you know, I think we've got to be very careful here about the kind of discount rate we apply to the distribution of the costs because particularly very low-income countries in Africa really cannot afford to spend 10% or so of their GDP on dealing with the immediate problem of a financial crisis because of the opportunity cost for public spending and, and development spending, even if they come out, you know, the, the government came out with a profit 20 years later <laughs> once it sold the recapitalized banks. So, thank you. Each have only 1.5 minutes. We must finish on time.
Okay, let me, uh, let me uh, respond to this question. First of all, the question about the house prices. Yeah, I mean, that is obviously central, central here. Typically, what you see in, in, you know, as, the, as the financial problems uh, develop before that, you see this boom in, in real estate, in, in house prices, often in the stock markets as well. And, and of course, what is important is, it, but it's not just the boom itself. You have to also have to look at, you know, is it financed by debt? Real estate very often is financed by fairly high debts, debts as well. The stock market prices, that's a bit more mixed, mixed case. You know, in fact, in the West, you know, we, we had the IT boom at the end of 90s. Actually, the biggest stock market boom was at the end of 90s. That was an IT boom, but I think that was almost everybody was caught by surprise. So that was, that, was, that was lucky for those who held the shares then. And then when it crashed, you know, you, that was cut on your net worth. But if it was not based on debt financing, then, then the problem of, 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 of debts not going down with the, with the prices when the IT boom crashed was not there. So, so the stock market booms can be different. It depends on whether the boom gets going so much and is fine. Is, is, you know, is, is the debt financed there or not? So the IT boom is a counterexample to that. That, you know, they created a recession, but only a mild recession. Uh, relative, you know, it could have been, if had it been debt financed, heavily debt financed boom, it would have been a, a big, big, big crisis there. So I think that is, you know, the role of asset prices is very important. Then Tony, Tony had this, uh, this, these two comments. One is on inflation targeting versus financial stability. This, of course, is an issue which, which the central banks are, are facing and, 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 and need to somehow, somehow deal with. You know, what, so far the response has been that let's keep the inflation targeting more or less in place, but add, add the macro prudential tools to this to try to, try to ensure financial stability. And, and that, those are, as, as Tony mentioned already, those are being developed. UK is a very good example. Also in the Nordic countries, you know, uh, legislation has either passed or is being done about uh, creating macro prudential tools for, for, usually it's the supervisor who will, who will decide on this, not necessarily the central bank, but there's, there's obviously going to be coordination on this. So I think that is an important development. It's a new development, so, so what's the, what are the right sort of levels and so forth is, is, is going to be difficult. It's going to be challenging on this. Uh, the, this, this pro, you know, what Tony also mentioned, this problem about that we have very low consumer price inflation, and, and, and high, high asset price increases at the moment. <clears throat> uh, yeah, that is a worrisome development, especially if it continues, uh, continues long enough. The problem, of course, is that the, the low, low inflation in commodity prices, I mean, there are, some, there are some various explanations. One is, of course, that there are things like energy prices and also food prices to some extent have, have uh, the inflation has been low and they've, they've, they've contributed. The other one, of course, is the is the fact that the central banks have had to, because of the, of the legacy of the, of the, you know, of the ongoing crisis, have, have, have to have very low interest rate policies. And, and, and the banking system depends on the country in, in question, but the banking systems are not particularly strong. So starting to raise the interest rates is, you know, U.S. is now thinking about it and, and moving very gradually. Britain is thinking about it. ECB is not yet thinking about it. And one big reason is that you have to do it very carefully because of the fact that the financial systems are not necessarily all that strong. But this is contributing to, to some, of the, some of the problems here. Uh, so, so we certainly have a very challenging time ahead of us. And I, at this, this framework of putting inflation targeting together with financial stability, the details are, are being worked out. And the but we have little experience on this. So, so this is, this is a complicated subject where we have to tread carefully and just try to do a good job in, you know, in, in central banking there. You're right also about the gross versus net cost, uh, that, uh, and that it can be very tough for developing countries. Obviously, it depends also on the situation. What, were your, what was your situation with fi public finances before the crisis erupted? Uh, again, I don't know the de developing country experience in detail, but you know, if you look at Ireland, for example, they had very low public debt before the current banking problems and the banking crisis there developed uh, and, and erupted. Uh, and they've now, they've decided to, you know, increase public debt in a big way. I mean, they, they just went that way, uh, that way 
so you know they had about a little over 20 percent public GDP debt to GDP ratio before it now it's well over 100 it's over 100 now and that is a very large extent of that is is the banking crisis the gross fiscal cost uh, you know it's difficult to estimate we, we can only do this afterwards very well but looks like the gross fiscal cost is maybe three times the Finnish one which was 10 percent of GDP roughly <laughs> so so that's uh, they've they've gone that sort of way, uh, so so this is but I under, this is this is just this one of these very nasty and very hard problems that countries which uh, face a crisis well, they have to decide what to do with the banking system. Iceland, of course, is a different case. They they bank, they they bankrupted the banks and started new banks, but they still have a lot of old obligations in place and and. Cleaning, cleaning out the mess that way is not a simple way either. It's, it's complicated. Uh, I always try to push the idea that the 2008 crisis was a microprudential crisis, even though one of the key lessons of the crisis is the need for macroprudential policies. But since you're talking about the real estate prices, let me just make the connection. And uh, this is one of the lessons that uh, Sepa was mentioning in his talk, and I couldn't agree more. And let me just tell you from personal experience, in Chile in the last two years, um, we basically follow one of these macroprudential recommendations, forcing the three key authorities to meet every month with the president of the central bank, the minister of finance, and the bank regulator to discuss several issues that are happening in the economy. Um, and let me tell you that after two years of meetings, that started in 2011, um, the president of the central bank and the minister of finance were 100% of the time there. I mean, it's not that they send their junior economists or their friend or whatever. I mean, they were there and they had full commitment. And one of the things that we the vote more time had to do with real estate prices. In Chile, we have not had a crisis in the real estate market since 1998. And at some point, it's going to happen. And the taller you go, the deeper you fall, uh, the stronger you fall. So we're really concerned. And the fact that you meet every month, and you share information, and you have the central bank with the macro view, you have the fiscal part behind, and you have the microprudential regulator together, and having the president of the central bank giving speeches, just out of the blue saying, you know what? Last crisis was in 1998. Be careful. Just that generated a lot of, a re, uh, a lot of re rejection from the, from the construction sector, of course, but at the same time, it, it made some changes in the market. It may be unfair, but it happened. And my experience was really positive in that respect, so I wanted to mention that. Okay, thank you uh, for the two excellent speakers and also discussion. Thank you. And thank you for your participation in the discussion. Now is the time for coffee. Thank you.